All right, let's open our Bibles, go to our preaching time. Let me have you to open your Bibles first to the book of Acts, chapter 2. Acts, chapter 2. Acts, chapter 2, and verses 41 and 42. Acts 2, verses 41 and 42. I'm going to begin reading there. The day of Pentecost says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Go forward to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians 2 and verse 9. <clears throat> and when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was um, given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision, the Jews. The Bible uses the word fellowship 16 times. Twice in the Old Testament, 14 times in the New Testament. We'll cover a few of them. We're not going to read all of them. Webster's Dictionary, the 1828 edition, defines fellowship as, quote, companionship, a society, mutual association of persons on equal and friendly terms. That's a perfectly fine definition of it. Fellowship is what you is what joins you to someone else. Um, you and the other person are in total agreement about each other and about your common desires. And fellowship is something you have. Sometimes they talk about a, a fellowship, something you can belong to. You and other people with very similar uh, interests pursuing the same career, the same goal. But fellowship is what joins you to someone else. Belonging to the same denomination is not enough. Belonging to the same local church is not enough. Uh, what is it that makes us enjoy being with each other? What is it that makes us want to spend time with each other? I heard an atheist on a talk show once ask, Why do Christians and religious people feel the need to meet every Sunday? Because atheists only need a convention once a year. Well, I like to eat every day. I like to breathe every day. Um... I like to have a day off from work each week, uh, and, if, and if you realized how obnoxious we consider you to be, you wouldn't want to spend time with you either. That's, that's, that would be my response. But in the Old Testament references, they read like this. If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, and uh, hath deceived his neighbor, or have found that, excuse me, or have found that which was lost, and lie, lieth uh, concerning it, and, I'm sorry, and sweareth falsely, in a in any of all in any of all these that a man doeth sinning therein Leviticus six verses two and three I stumbled there a minute two Jews who were both descended from Abraham they may be from different tribes 
live near each other. Maybe their property lines touch each other. But the temptation to cheat the neighbor or to steal from your neighbor was very strong. Fellowship was limited in the Old Testament way it, it was used. When the popes talk about all Christians being one, as Christ prayed, what they really mean is they want all people who say that they're Christians to submit to the Vatican and the Catholic Church. That's what they mean. And they also display their monumental stupidity of the scriptures. The Apostle Paul wrote, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, and have been all, been, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. And he wrote earlier, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians 7, um, or rather 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17. And the other reference to fellowship in the Old Testament reads like this. The psalmist asks a question, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? Psalm 94, verse 20. A wicked king wants to get away with sin, but he's afraid of public scandal. So his counselors and advisors find some way to create a law which will allow him to do what he wants to do, to participate in pagan uh, people's worship, their pagan gods, and so forth. That's the modern condition of the United States right now. We have 435 members of the House Representatives, another 100 in the U.S. Senate, 535 Congress members, all unsaved. Uh, maybe one or two are saved, but they're, they're completely ineffectual. And they pass laws to allow sin. And uh, between the, the Congress and the courts, they pass laws to allow wickedness to, to run rampant. Uh, queers getting married and calling it a, uh, calling it a family. Um, allowing 10-year-old kids to decide, I want to change my sex. I don't want to be a little boy anymore. I want to be a little girl uh, without consulting the parents. Oftentimes, you have uh, uh, the allowance of or the permission of abortion for almost 40 years in this country, or 50 years almost. And um, not only were people um, excited when they could go back to drinking after the repeal of prohibition, but now we've given them the freedom to smoke pot everywhere they go. You know, when they passed that law allowing marijuana nationwide, it took 12 days before they had their first fatality on the highway in the state of Washington. 12 whole days. I wonder why they waited so long. But don't you think, don't you think there's some connection between people who have given up on life years ago to get drunk um, and to get high and the growing number of homeless people all over the country? Don't you think there may be some connection Got people living on the streets of L.A. County, at least 40,000, maybe more. Tents and grocery carts everywhere you go, and that is spreading everywhere else throughout the country. What kind of insanity uh, is running this place? Years and years ago, Lester Roloff, who had um, Christian uh, girls reform home down in Texas, the government wanted to come in and shut him down because he didn't have enough uh, proper bathroom facilities or he had some small little thing that they, they thought they should crack down on and uh, shut him down. And he was doing a great work helping girls who had home life troubles and, you know, unwanted pregnancy type problems. Um, and Lester Roloff said, America, and I'm going back 50 years, America is an insane asylum being run by the inmates. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He was right then, 
and it's even more true now. But um, the word fellowship was very weak in the way it could be used in those two instances in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul warned the church at Corinth uh, about this Old Testament application. And he said, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. You know something? You can't go with your unsaved Catholic friend to their church and get in their communion line and think, well, it, the symbolism's about the same about Jesus. No, it's not. It's not the same at all. They worship unclean spirits. They worship an unclean demon goddess of the ancient world. She was called Ishtar in uh, ancient Babylon, uh, Isis in ancient Egypt, Astarte, Ashtoreth, uh, also by the, among the uh, Canaanites. Um, she was called Diana and the city of Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. She was called Xing Mu in China, 1500 years before Christ. Now they call her the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Virgin, the Ever Virgin, the Virgin Goddess, Mary the Queen of Heaven, Mary the Mother of God. Jeremiah identified her. He says, the Queen of Heaven, Jeremiah 7, verse 18. Jeremiah 44, verse 17, and verse 25. He said they bake cakes to worship her, pour out drink offerings, and burn incense to her. That's what they're doing down at the Catholic Church uh, today. They worship a demon goddess of the ancient world, and uh, she's just changed her name many, many times. You have nothing in common with them. Nothing at all. Amos, the prophet Amos, chapter 3, verse 3, asks, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, obviously not. What do you have in common with them? So what are the things that give us true fellowship, that knit us together, that bind us to one another, that make us enjoy the time we spend with each other. I like singing the songs with you. I like reading the Word of God with you. I like praying with you. I like spending time with you. And uh, I trust you feel the same toward me. But um, So I call this sermon today the basis of our fellowship. The basis of our fellowship. I went a little long in my introduction, so I'm going to try to abbreviate the points as best as I can. The first text we read, Acts 2, verse 42, says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Steadfast means they were determined to make it work. They were trusting the apostles to study the, old te the, the scriptures as they had them, and figure out what it is the Lord's now doing. And they weren't going to give up. Even though they may have come from different uh, tribes on the day of Pentecost, different territories, uh, multiple languages of the known world at that time, and they're, they're listed in the first part of Acts chapter 2, about verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Um, suddenly, those who were being filled with the Holy Spirit had a camaraderie with the others that were there that um, couldn't be accounted for any other way except the work of God. So the basis of our fellowship. You can write a few points down, if you will. Point number one, we have fellowship because we have the same Savior, the same... Only the Savior can save your church membership can't save you. Your ritual or your religious ordinance cannot help you. 
your best efforts and the best smile on your face and a good intention in your heart can't wash away your sins. Nothing can do it except well, what can wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. Well, if all have sinned, then all need to be forgiven. And um, until you can admit to God you're a guilty sinner in his eyes, and your best efforts will never get you to heaven, and uh, beg for his forgiveness, you're not going to make it. You're lost. You're on your way to hell. You need to be forgiven by God and his grace and his and, and wash clean by faith in the fact that his blood was shed for your sake. I'll never forget the day I was saved. I'll never forget the moment, the hour, the circumstances. The best as I can recall, I was a little boy, but it's the most vivid memory of my young childhood. And uh, I've never forgotten it in all of these years. I trust I never will. But um, suddenly you have a, a friendship and a kinship with people who have trusted Jesus as well. And uh, a new kinship begins with, um, with the next person who gets saved as well. You all enter into the same body of believers. You're all collectively, uh, you, you collectively make up the bride of Jesus Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you and I have fellowship because of the same Savior. Do you know something? It doesn't matter if you come from a, a Chinese background, a Korean background, Hispanic background, a white background, uh, wherever you, your ancestry may come from, whatever language they spoke, whatever education differences you may have, whatever sex you are, whatever age you are, uh, it doesn't matter. The same blood of Jesus Christ is the agent that saves a soul. Nothing else can do it. You and I have instant fellowship because of the same Savior. I've spoken to, I spoke to Brother Del Grande um, yesterday or day before, yesterday. Um, and he, he led, uh, no, no, it wasn't Brother Del Grande. I'll take that back. Another, another guy from PBI yesterday, he led a lady to the Lord over the phone. She's back in Chicago and he's, he's out here. Um, two weeks ago, led her to the Lord over the phone, and there was a church back there that said they were King James uh, Bible-believing church, and uh, he spoke to the pastor back there to see if he could send this lady to him to, to help disciple her. And he spoke real highly of Pensacola Bible Institute and Dr. Ruckman's preaching. And so Brother Del Grande sent this, uh, not, not uh, my friend sent this lady to that church. And the first time he met the lady, he started to blast Dr. Ruckman's teaching and preaching and criticize everything they taught there and uh, ruined her, broke her down to tears. She called uh, my friend and was just weeping, couldn't understand why a guy would talk that way. So he called that preacher again and blast the, the, the dickens out of that guy, said, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ for ruining a, a brand new Christian, two weeks old. And I trust that he will. God knows what he's doing. Secondly, let me say this. We have fellowship because we have the same burden. The same burden, at least for lost people. We should. We should have. If the Lord saved your soul cleansed you from the guilt of your sin, wouldn't you want him to do the same for someone else? Your own family members, your flesh and blood, your friends, people you work with, or anyone God sends in your path gives you a chance to talk to and a witness to. We have the same burden to see people get saved. No believer should be saved for 10 or 20 years or more and never make any attempt to leave the gospel or help someone know how to be born again or why they should be. 
how simple it is to be forgiven of their sins and God will save them for all of eternity. Nobody should do it. Now, it may turn out you're not real good at it. Some people have a natural talent. Uh, others don't. They have to work harder at it. My dad's a natural soul winner. My dad's a natural soul winner. He's been saved 68 years. Still leading souls to Christ as God gives him chance to do so. Um, I'm very fortunate. Let me pause for a moment. I'm very, very fortunate to have a mother and father. I think my mom was saved even before my dad was. Uh, who read their Bible every single morning. I mean, every single day. They spend time in prayer and they're reading the Word of God. And it never gets old. You, can, you can't exhaust the written words of God. You can never learn it all. I think Dr. Ruckman would, would have said he had read through the Bible just from cover to cover, just daily reading uh, close to 200 times over the years of his preaching. That didn't even count specific Bible studies for uh, teaching and class and preaching. And he said, you can never get ahead of the book. And that's very true. If you spend time reading the Bible daily, believing that what you're reading is the Word of God, God will bless. God will bless. And uh, God will give you the, the, the drive and the desire to witness to someone, try to find some way to uh, get the gospel into their mind and their soul. What they do with it becomes between them and God. But your effort is to, you should make the effort. Do something. But uh, we have fellowship because we share the same burden for the lost. Thirdly, let me say this today. We have fellowship with one another because we share the same convictions. We have the same convictions. There are certain things that Christians uh, begin to realize, I can't do that. I can't listen to that. I can't watch that. I can't go there. Those people aren't going to be helpful to me. I shouldn't hang around them. There's some places I don't need to, don't need to be, don't need to be seen. Years ago, I was with a friend. We were, oh, I mean, years and years ago. 35, 37, 8 years ago. We were driving around downtown Ontario. And uh, we pulled up to this, it was a liquor store. Uh, he wanted to get a Coke. And I got a candy bar or something. But I, I never darkened the door of liquor stores. So we pulled right up along the curb, right by the entrance, went in. Next thing you know, I hear, hey, Mike, how you doing? I turn around, and Robert Gann was parked in the, right behind us here. Oh, a guy from church sees me going in a liquor store wondering what I'm doing. <laughs> so you become more mindful of where you go, what you do, what people see you do, uh, how you conduct yourself. You, you begin to drop any uh, language that sounds a little too aggressive to the Apostle Paul says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer, Ephesians 4, verse 29. And the Lord Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So that matches the Apostle Paul. A Christian's life is to be clean, is to be pure, is to be holy, is to be virtuous, is to be spotless. Uh, you don't want people being able to accuse you of wickedness. When the Lord Jesus asked his uh, uh, tormentors in Acts, or John chapter 8, which of you convinceth me of sin? None of them could. Nobody could cite an example where Christ had ever violated the laws of Moses or broken any law. You never read the Lord Jesus Christ had to bring a sacrifice to the temple because he had committed no sin. No sin in thought, word, or deed. It's hard to imagine someone that pure walking among men for 33 and a half years and yet still without sin. 
That goes beyond anything we can imagine. And if his life was that impeccable and he could say, which of you can cite an example of me sinning, then your life should be the kind where you have nothing to worry about. No one can accuse you of wickedness or uh, double standards or having bad taste, bad morals, um, and so forth. But your life is to be clean like the Lord Jesus Christ. And too many professing Christians today think they can justify certain kinds of sin, certain kind of things, actions, activities. Uh, the pastor who founded the church here 70 years ago, uh, Reverend Underhill, would tell the story of a guy who said, my, was I my son-in-law, maybe my son, had a whole bunch of alcohol, beer in his refrigerator. What should I do, pastor? He said, close the refrigerator and mind your own business, basically. You've got to leave that up between him and God and pray if God will get a hold of him. And ultimately, that was the best advice. Sometimes Christians want to fix everything that it's not their business to fix. You have to let God fix it. And if God can fix it, God can change their heart and bring some conviction to them about this, that, or the other. They'll change. They'll change good. They'll change permanently. But um, point number four today. Point number four today. We have fellowship because not only because of the same Savior, not only because of the same burden, not only because of the same convictions, but fourthly, we have fellowship because we read the same Bible. We read the same Bible. I have a Bible... Uh, several Bibles now, uh, first translated and published in 1611, over 400 years ago. And to me, it's not out of date at all. You and I don't need the Book of Mormon to complete our Bible. You and I don't need the words of the popes to tell us what our Bible means, where we can read it in our own language. They need us because they're idiots, but we don't need them. Our Bible doesn't need to be updated and revised and improved and modified and second-guessed and retranslated every five to six years. Uh, and I've said many times, it's not my job to correct the, the, the Word of God. The Word of God's job is to correct me. Leave it at that. Leave it as it is. Uh, leave every word, every punctuation mark as God gave it to you. And trust him to be your guide and teacher. Let me be real uh, simple about this. I have no fellowship with someone whose Bible undermines the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 2 verse 33. Just about all of them do it. I have no fellowship with someone whose Bible says water baptism is all that's necessary for salvation. Acts 8, verse 37. I have no fellowship with someone whose Bible uh, undermines the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 14. We have nothing in common. And, and, it's, and it's fair for me to ask if they're even saved, if they're even born again. How could you say, I'm truly saved and I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I have a Bible that uh, attacks just about every wonderful virtue of him and his ministry. I have no fellowship with that person at all. Nor should you. Our first text that we read, Acts 2, verse 42, says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Well, the apostles were studying the scriptures to see what it was God was now revealing. They had to be studying the same thing. They had to be reading the same uh, words on the same uh, manuscripts to understand that they're all on the same page. They're going to agree together on what's being taught, what's being revealed to the apostles.
But you and I have fellowship because we read the same Bible. I don't understand why everybody thinks they have to have a new translation of the Bible every five or six years. You know, since 1900 until now, 2020, I guess, there have been at least 100 translations launched onto the market. At least. Everybody goes to Bible school and they learn a little bit about uh, Greek and how to translate it into English. And suddenly they think they're qualified to rewrite the entire Bible in their own words. I don't want to write it in my words. I want to know it in God's words, right? I want to know it the way God d decided to give it to us by his providence. One who believes the Bible, uh, the copies of the Old Testament and New Testament that he holds in his hands and he can read in his own language, make the Bible without any need of improvement, is a Bible believer. How much he reads it, that's going to be a different issue between him and the Lord. But if he, for example, if you, you and I might believe everything we read on that page of that Bible to be there by the will of God. And you might, this may be remote, but you might run into a Lutheran, some Lutheran minister, and there may be some, some uh, free Methodist minister, and the way they grew up, the way they were trained, they only had one Bible when they were young, and they believe that that's the right Bible. They don't need a new one. You might meet someone like that. It's probably slim, a uh, slim chance. But if you met someone like that, do you know something? You at least have a starting point for some measure of fellowship. Now you can ask questions and they can give you um, their honest response from the Word of God or they can tell you what their denomination believes. And you can tell them what the Word of God says. So it may not be much help to you, but there's at least a starting point for you to have some measure of fellowship and agreement if that person truly got saved years and years ago, and they have confidence in the right word of God, who knows why they got stuck in a church like in either of those for so long, but there's something you have in common with them. You can't deny that. The word of God, and I, I see these people on different TV talk shows, uh, women and men, who say they're ministers, I'm a Christian pastor, I'm a Christian minister. And even through the, through the internet or through the video screen, the Holy Spirit seems to bear witness that person's not truly saved. It doesn't matter what they say, it doesn't matter what they're telling the talk show host. There's something about that person that the Holy Spirit just doesn't resonate with the Holy Spirit in me. They're, they're maybe they're using the, you know, common language, trying to talk the talk, but uh, there's something about them, I can't put my finger on it, but I don't think they're truly saved. Maybe some of you have experienced that, maybe you haven't, but I, I pick it up quite often. Um, lastly, let me say this today. We have fellowship because we have the same hope. We have the same hope. Looking for the glorious appearing in the blessed of the blessed God and our excuse me, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Titus uh, two fifty two thirteen. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We don't see it yet, but we know that when He shall appear. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purify himself, even as he is pure. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. No, I read that one, I'm sorry. Um... But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, as even as others which have 
no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. When your loved one passes, if they knew Jesus Christ, and you're confident of that, there's no reason to, to, to fret. You should have great hope and confidence. Be ready to meet them again. And get ready to meet them again. Uh, but if, if they weren't, well then, you have every reason to cry and weep. But someone who knew Jesus Christ and was confident of their own salvation, you should have no fear. Uh, you should trust them. You're, several years ago, most of you remember Alice Mendez. She used to come. She sat over near, not far where Jan, Sister Jan is. Sweet lady. We had her funeral service here. And I remember thinking, Sister Alice is just as alive in my mind and uh, in truth as she ever was. And I still feel that way. I feel that way about my, my own grandparents, both sides of my family, um, and people I've known and loved. I'm looking forward to seeing and meeting them again. And, uh, of course, I look forward to seeing the Lord Jesus Christ, first and foremost, and then praise Him through all of eternity with them. Uh, it's the idea that that um, I'd have to force myself to want to be with them. No, they and I are already joined together. The Bible says, God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 6. So, part of me, part of you, are already in the third heaven. We're waiting for these bodies to be changed soon and to be have our transformation made complete. But part of me is already in heaven, walking around the third heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. To, to wrap your mind around that is very difficult to do. But it's nevertheless the truth. We have fellowship because of these things. There may be many more, but I listed about five or six. True fellowship is between two believers who truly know the same Savior. They know the same Savior, and uh, from that they share the same convictions or the same, the same burden to reach lost people. They read the same scriptures, and they have the same hope. Hope. That's a great word. It, it's one of those things that relieves the, the fear and the stress and the anxiety uh, hope, something to hang on to, right? We don't be like stupid politicians who say keep hope alive. No, I don't, no, that's that's not our that's not our thinking. You know, keep hope alive, get rid of them. Um, but um, and all of those things come from the same Savior, and we have fellowship because of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that He's provided for us.